know when you try something new and you have something super important to do and so somebody's super awesome to chat with, things go sideways. Okay. It looks like it's working Always. out. So, okay. Welcome to our Thursday night live stream. Sorry for that little bit of a delay. We were having, we're all going to blame Chris. This is Chris Bear's fault. Because Chris told me to use a new platform. No. And uh, yeah, I don't know. We were having an issue. It was saying that the feed wasn't coming through, even though we had, <laughs> <laughs> we had an issue. We grabbed a tissue. And now we move on. Okay. I'm Rachel. And I'm Joe. And we're Two, Two Crazy, Crazy Ketos. Ketos. And if you're new to our channel, welcome. Here on Two Crazy Ketos, we do different things like mm -hmm. recipe videos and product reviews. We talk about various keto topics. Every Monday, we sit down on the couch and talk about what's going on in our lives for the week. You can find us in different social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we have a website, which is twocrazyketos.com. And that's where you're going to find all of our different recipes. Now we do upload at least five new videos every single week. So make sure you subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit the little bell icon in that way. Every single time we upload a new video, you'll be alerted to it. So we are super excited. Because we love to talk about keto topics, but sometimes we get to talk about keto topics with somebody super mega ultra awesome. And I think we're at the awesome of the awesomest tonight. We are. We have Dr. Ken Berry. Yay! And I think I, there's not much introduction needed. Everybody should know who Dr. Berry is. The doctor. We just finished organizing the proper human diet summit, which was amazing. He put together him and his beautiful, amazing wife, Nisha from Nisha Loves It put together such an amazing lineup of speakers and they took the proper human diet from every angle, from like the womb to the tomb. Right. They like handled every kind of question and angle that you may be having thrown at you trying to live this lifestyle. Yep. Yeah. So with that saying, we got Dr. Barry here. Let's let him talk about. Yes. The, I want Dr. Barry, first thing I want to ask you is, can you tell everybody what is the proper human diet and why you started using that term? In my opinion, the proper human diet is filled with real, whole, one ingredient foods and uh, with a goodly portion of fatty meat. And in my, in my opinion, from looking at the paleoanthropology and the archaeology and, and, and studying this very widely, not only from a medical standpoint, but from a nutritional standpoint, and then looking very, very far back in the history of human development, we do best if we eat a, a, a diet that is predominantly fatty meat. And so I think for some people, it can be, you know, a little, a little over half their plate covered with fatty meat and then the rest of the plate covered with veg. And for some people that works amazingly well. And for some people that plate needs to be covered almost entirely with fatty meat of some kind. It can be seafood. It can be red meat. For me personally, and for many people, ruminant meat seems to be the best. So that'd be cow, sheep, goat, uh, venison, any any of the ruminant animals. For other people, they can add chicken and pork and 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 possum and and skunk, and it works just fine for them. As long as it's it's meat with lots of good protein, vitamins, and minerals, balanced with either fat that comes with that meat or fat that they've added. Uh, the reason I've started to use the terminology proper human diet is because when somebody hears that term, that, that's not triggering. It's not, it doesn't sound like a fad. It doesn't sound like some, some weird science experiment. It just sounds like the proper human diet. That's what right. humans should eat if they want optimal health. And uh, the proper human diet is just another name for a low carbohydrate diet that's filled with real whole one ingredient foods. And so keto can absolutely be PhD, ketovore, carnivore, even a low carb diet that's that that is only real whole one ingredient foods can be a proper human diet. And so and also it makes it much easier for people who are just starting this, whether it's keto, carnivore, whatever, if you call this the proper human diet, then questions like, hey, can I do the proper human diet if I don't have a gallbladder? Well, right. yeah. yeah. The proper human, you're still, still human. human. You're still human. You can do the PhD, and I think that that just it doesn't sound like a science experiment. Like keto sounds to some people, they're like ketosis. What? Because right. it, the the ketones that are are produced in a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet or a ketovore diet, they are very important, very therapeutic. They do hundreds of things in our body besides just provide energy. 
But for many people who don't have a degree in biochemistry, a ketogenic, that just sounds chemically and weird and unusual and, and faddish. And so I, I tried to come up with some terminology that just made sense to everybody. No matter what you do for a living, the proper human diet, that makes sense. It does. And I love that you're helping us to keep it simple. You know, I'm shopping the outer, you know, area of the grocery store and I can find everything that I need to make my eating choices successful. And now you've added another layer because as great as you are at trying to find all of the components, all the vitamins, the nutrients and the minerals that you need to be successful, there are some things that we just can't get anymore because right. of the soil and you know what's going on right now in the world. So is that was that your motivator for for helping to develop this? Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you because I was I we told people the other day with the property I like the term because it's encompassing everyone because i feel like we've gotten off into like i'm carnivore i'm ketovore i'm dirty keto i'm lazy keto and i feel like proper human diet kind of brings everybody back together into this one great people plus like the term keto everywhere is getting such a negative connotation but these are super important yeah and i wanted to talk about why you helped keto child develop them so the, the problem is, is, is when a human being is eating the proper human diet, they should be able to get all of the vitamins and minerals that they need from that food. And indeed, I've got a lot of YouTube videos about potassium rich foods, magnesium rich foods, right? Selenium, where, where do you get selenium in your diet? Where do you get iodine in your diet? But here's the rub. And here's the thing that I bumped up against that I just couldn't do anything about. Because I would love it if we could just eat the PhD and know that we're getting all our minerals and that be the end of it. Then we could all just go play table tennis after we ate. And not <laughs> play but the problem is, is that the soil that food is grown in these days has become so depleted because, you know, a hundred years ago, farmers put manure on their fields, <clears throat> which came from cows or horses that were eating a proper cow diet or a proper horse diet. And so that that soil literally had every vitamin and mineral in it that you needed. The, and we'll focus on the minerals since we're talking about the mineral drops. But you know, unless you lived in a region of the world, like up around Minnesota and Wisconsin, there there's just not enough iodine in the soil. And in fact, back uh, around World War One, when they were... Uh, recruiting boys to come be in the army, they call that part of the country the gorder belt because almost everybody there had a gorder because there was just no iodine occurring naturally in the soil. Wow. And so you could eat 100% PhD and you'd still be deficient in iodine if you lived in that area of the country. And so that's a problem. But the problem is, is all of the millions of acres uh, over across the United States that are monocropped, soybean crops, corn, wheat, rice, oats, all that stuff have been farmed to death. And farmers will put back in potassium and phosphorus, right? And, and they'll put there, there's, there's three or four things that they'll put in every year because that makes a plant grow vigorously and be large and dark green but no farmers saying i wonder if i should add some boron to the crops this year or maybe i should put some maybe i should you know pay the co-op fifty thousand dollars for a zinc treatment for my for my five no nobody's doing that and and so that's the first problem is that many of our soils are now depleted in some of these minerals that are absolutely essential for even proper human function, much less optimal human function. Now, this... there's one more problem. Hold on, Rachel. There's one more problem. And that's the that farmers are constantly, they want to have the biggest, prettiest fill in the blank that you can possibly have because right. that's what sells. And so if you're growing apples, you want to have a gigantic two pound, beautiful apple. And so that's what farmers have bred for. They're, they've bred for bigger heads of broccoli and they've bred for longer, crunchier shoots of asparagus. And you can't blame them for that because they've got to they got to feed the family. So when they go to market, they got to have beautiful produce or it won't sell. 
but right. nobody thought to breed for nutrition. And so there's actually a study. I'm working on a, a video about minerals right now. There's a study that between the 1940s and 2000, many of like if you compare broccoli in 1940 to broccoli in 2000, it's deficient in virtually every one of these minerals because farmers have been selecting and selecting for the biggest, most beautiful head of broccoli. And it literally says in the paper, nobody ever thought to breed for, for nutrition. We were breeding for appearance and we were breeding for taste. And you can't blame them. That's very common sense. But at the same time, you would have thought at some time a, a food scientist or somebody would have said, are you, are you, are you considering the nutrition of the plant? Right, right. Because nobody did. Well, I know well, I even know. for me growing up, I grew up on Long Island and every like the end of the summer, we would drive out to the east end of Long Island and we would spend the entire day picking enough vegetables that my family would can for over a week, like just went out with our suburban and filled up garbage cans of vegetables. And I remember we would go apple picking. And I look at the apples today. Very they're different. like four times the size of the things that we used to pick off of the trees. And my mom grew all her own vegetables, still does at the age of 80. And nothing in the store looks like what she's growing with her own fresh hands in the backyard. Right, exactly. Now, what I was going to say, though, is this looks very simple. Now, I had a giant Vera Bradley super cute bag that I used to hold all of my pill bottles in, my vitamins. I could choke a donkey with how many vitamins I was taking. Yep. I had very interesting looking urine. And yeah. I think it was just expensive urine. How am I getting every single thing in here? And, and now I have to use my Vera Bradley for something else. Yeah. So the, this is basically every mineral that is essential or in, and a couple of the ones in there are not have not been deemed by the US, uh, USDA as essential, although the uh, European Union they consider them to be essential. And, and if you want to, we can talk about each one in, in detail. But most other countries consider uh, manganese to be an essential mineral. But in the U.S., it, there's there's disagreement. Like, oh, we don't know if it's essential or not, even though there are enzymatic reactions in the human body that just won't occur if you don't have magnesium as part of that or mag manganese as part of that reaction. The same thing goes for molybdenum. The same thing goes um, for chromium. Without these, there are certain enzyme, uh, enzymes that just won't work to catalyze reactions that have to happen in your body if you're going to have all the energy and all the things working like they're supposed to be working. And so I, I, there, I started looking at mineral drops because I thought, well, I'll find one I really like and I'll just, you know, get an affiliate link and I'll just recommend this this. And so every one I found was either ungodly expensive <laughs> or they would be a trace mineral drop. And what they meant by trace was they ain't but just a trace in this bottle. And so they, and literally some of these things that you need several milligrams a day, there would be less than one milligram of that mineral in the supplement. So it's like, that's, I mean, somebody would have to, you know, take the whole bottle to actually get enough of that mineral to be meaningful. And so I got with Chris Bayer, and uh, unlike the this new platform you're doing live on, the drops, <laughs> actually, the drops actually went very well. We, we, we exchanged emails for months trying to hammer down the formula so that it was going to be affordable, that it was going to have all the minerals that we need in meaningful amounts. And it was okay. going to, you know, not break, not break the bank. You'd have to pawn a kid to be able to afford them. Well, that's what I want. You say affordable. So people are saying, well, it's $52 for a bottle. Now, if you use like our discount link down below or Dr. Barry's discount link, if you're on his Patreon group, you get 10% off of that. So that pretty much covers shipping and a couple bucks more. $52 for 64 servings. I personally don't think that that's super expensive, yeah. but- a lot of what do you say to people who are like, well, that's a lot of money. Or well, you say people just, are saying say, like it's got the word no. keto, so you're charging more money. Hey, listen, I've been broken as, as a joke for, for many years coming up. Okay. And so I totally understand that. What I would say to that person is, no, you're I mean, 50 bucks is 50 bucks. But I what I want you to do is I want you to go try to find another 
mineral supplement that has what this has for a comparable price. And what you're going to find is that any mineral drop that comes close to having both the quality of mineral that's in this in these drops and the quantity, you're going to be looking at 70 to 150 bucks for, for a, a comparable product. And uh, I mean, Chris really whittled the price down as low as, as he could possibly get it. And I really appreciate him for doing that. Okay, what about taste? Yeah, I was going to say, they are not making this like a keto lollipop flavor. No. Yeah, this is definitely uh, is for grown-ups. And when I say <laughs> if, you're, if you're expecting, um, you know, some kind of uh, protein shake or fruit smoothie flavor, that's not what this is. This has absolutely no sweeteners. It has no fla artificial flavors or even natural flavors. It is just the minerals. And so you, uh, some people are saying that they just take their tablespoon shot and they're done for the day. Yeah, Other that's real. Saying, yeah, that, that causes me to have a tummy ache or I get nauseated. And I mean, that's a lot of minerals to just shoot in one shot. I don't think it's in any way dangerous. But if you don't like that that way, then don't do it that way. What I do is I, I dilute them. I've got some in my Topo Chico right now. And so... If any of you guys have had Keto Chow's little fasting drops or their electrolyte drops, I've got a little extra squeeze bottle. And so I just pour the mineral drops in that. And I have that little bottle sitting by the coffee maker by the fridge. So if I have a cup of coffee, I put a squirt of mineral drops. If I have a glass of water, I put a squirt of mineral drops. But I think really the best way, if you just, if you just hate the taste and you just can detect it in water, the best thing to do is to cook with them because – that's minerals what he's doing. Right. Yeah. Minerals don't evaporate when you cook. If you cook something hot enough and long enough, you might break down some of the vitamins. That's true. But minerals are elements. Remember the periodic table of the elements? That's what these things are. And so you can cook these things all day for five days. They're still going to be sitting right there smiling at you because they're, unless your stove gets hot enough to perform nuclear fusion, <laughs> You're not going to change these minerals. It's still going to be zinc and manganese and, and boron and copper. You're not going to cook these things and, and destroy them in some way. So the very best way to I've found is if you're making a pot of chili soup, bone broth, even some, when I'm cooking a steak, I'll put a squirt on, on the steak. And it, it when you mix it with food like that, it just tastes salty. It just tastes like salt. Yeah. I actually, we, we eat a lot of ground beef. We probably each eat about a pound of ground beef a day. And that's when I'm cooking up the ground beef on like the black zone or something. I just put a shot of it in there and it, you don't taste it. it. It's like adding a bunch of red yeah, meat to it. It really does yeah. just taste like you salted your food appropriately. Yep. So I mentioned Redmond. Redmond is sponsoring. I know Dr. Cywis is actually hosting starting this Sunday, their 72 hour end of the month fast. Is this going to break a fast if you're doing the 72 hour fast? No, not at all. There's no sweet flavor. Uh, as some people will tell you, there's definitely no sweet flavor in the mineral drops, right? <laughs> there's, there's no carbohydrates. There's no protein. There's not even any fat. It's just minerals and water. That's all okay. it is. And so people may not know, you know, I'm a, I, I studied biochemistry and organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. So I, when I say a mineral, I know what I know what I mean. People don't realize that sodium and potassium and, mag and magnesium and chloride those are also elements, right? They're you could they are they are in the mineral family. So electrolytes and minerals are basically the same thing. They're just different ones. And so yeah, just just like keto chow's fasting drops and electrolyte drops or Redmond's. Uh, uh, electrolyte products, they don't break a fast. This is definitely not going to break a fast either. Well, I was going to actually ask you about that. So if, if, <laughs> if you're fasting, for example, you're going to do the 72 hour fast this week. Is one yep. shot of this enough or do we need something else? Do we need to be adding more sodium or more potassium? Because this isn't <clears throat> everything you need for the day, right? If you do one yeah. tablespoon. Yeah. And so first of all, if you're a grown adult, a tablespoon it would be analogous to the recommended daily intake. That doesn't mean it's the maximum intake. So you could add more if you wanted to. I probably I probably consume two tablespoons of the mineral drops a day on average. Like I said, I don't measure it. I just use my squirt bottle. And so there, there's no danger if you get a little bit more than a tablespoon of these drops. Okay. But 
if you would rather, you can just go ahead and get your minerals in like uh, Rachel does. And then you could use one of a keto chow's electrolyte drops. So they're fasting drops for the, for the remainder of that day of your fast. And then you're only getting the four elements, which would be sodium chloride, magnesium, and potassium. Okay. Now, since, since we're talking about Redmond and you mentioned that, do these break a fast? Because I know a lot of people say, well, there's some stevia in their flavored ones. Can you have this on a fast? Yeah, that's, and I think it's a valid question. The, they have an unflavored, which definitely will not break your fast. Right. Uh, I really like the berry, and I think it's lemon lime. Yeah. But he it, likes the it, berry. It, it, <laughs> probably, it probably depends on someone's metabolism and the strength of their cephalic phase insulin response. For some of us, the, the berry or lemon lime may not meaningfully raise their insulin, which is what we worried most about when we're fasting is trying to keep the insulin super, super low. Uh, there might be enough sweet taste in, in the flavored ones for some of us to meaningfully raise the insulin temporarily because of the cephalic phase insulin response. But I would, I would guess for most people, if they're diluting it in water, it, it's probably not going to taste sweet enough to kick that uh, process into effect. Now, if you have somebody who the only way they can get through a fast is having a couple of glasses of this because they need that flavor. They can't just handle just plain water with some salt in it. Yep. What do you think? What, my personal opinion is always, I always tell them like, if you need it and that, and that's the only thing you're going to consume, have at it. It's better than not fasting at all. But what do you think? Totally agree. Totally agree. If the only way you can get through a, a, an extended fast is to use the delicious Redmond's Relight berry flavor, I, that's a, a thousand times better than just not fasting at all. Okay. So we want to get back to the proper human diet. Okay, because I got a couple questions. Because in fact, we got a, we had a question from someone last night. Yeah. Who was talking about how they're they're finding on keto they've lost about a hundred pounds and they're barely eating and they're not hungry. And then she she I asked her like, what are you eating? And she's consuming about one hundred and twenty grams of fat a day, but only fifty grams of protein a day. And she's like, I'm afraid to. I feel like I need to eat more fat or I'm going to get kicked out of ketosis. And I'm looking at those numbers like you are not needing nearly enough protein. Yeah. And but of that. 120 grams of fat a day, she's consuming like four or five ounces of heavy whipping cream. Mm. So a lot of people, I think, look at the proper human diet or they look at keto and they're afraid of protein. They're like, you know, because for years, everyone's like, well, if you eat too much protein, you're going to get gluconeogenesis. You're going to get kicked out of keto because you're eating too much protein. What what do you think about the, the whole idea is like, you know, we're we don't even count anything anymore. We're just eating a bunch of meat and the fat that's in there. Great. Sometimes I'll add a tablespoon of butter. But a lot of times we don't even add a bunch of fat to our meat. We eat 80, 20 ground beef or we eat a ribeye and whatever fat's there, whatever fat's on the bacon, that's what we're going to eat. Yeah. When keto was first becoming popular, there were a, a few of the, the kind of the first influencers in the field who thought that the fat was magical. They didn't understand the underlying physiology. The whole, the way you get into ketosis is not by eating more fat. The way you get into ketosis is by lowering the carbohydrate intake. That's okay. how you get into ketosis. Now, some of us need more fat to be, to, to stay full and stay not starving to death all the time. And we know who we are, but pretty much we find out pretty quick uh, but but it's it, that's the thing. And so I don't think that and actually, Dr. Ben Bigman, he, he and I did a live together. And I think you may have talked about it during the Ph.D. as well. Carbohydrates are what kick you out of ketosis. If you're if you're eating a low, low carbohydrate diet, keto by definition, you're not going to eat enough protein to meaningfully raise your insulin enough to matter. In a, in a negative way. And you're also, you can't make your liver switch on gluconeogenesis just because you ate too much protein. It does not work that way. The liver can use amino acids that come from proteins to make glucose, but your liver's not an idiot. Your liver, <laughs> your liver was designed 
it's just, I mean, everybody's like, oh, the American Heart Association, you know, and the brain, but the liver really honestly needs its own organization because the liver, the heart's just a pump. Okay. The liver does, well, I don't we don't even know everything that the liver does to help us optimize our health. And the liver's not, it's not an idiot. It knows that if you don't need glucose, it's, it's not like, oh, well, they ate too much sirloin. I'm going to have to just pump out some glucose. It doesn't work that way. And so you're not meaningfully going to, to make your liver against its will pump out a bunch of glucose just because you ate too much protein. It does not work that way if you're eating a low-carb diet to start with. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want to talk about that? We, we, we noticed earlier in the, in, the, in the chat while we were waiting and we had questions. the issues, a lot of people, and I see this a lot on YouTube now, all of a sudden, everybody is promoting carb cycling. Like, yeah. you know what, keto, you know, and it's funny, I remember in January, I went and I sat down with Dr. Cywis, and if you want, I thought that you were to the point... <laughs> Until I spent an hour in his office, yeah, yeah, and he, you know, he was asking me questions like, "Why are you fat?" And I'm like, <laughs> "What?" And and you know, and he's being honest, and he was like, "Because you're an addict, you're an addict. That's why yeah. you were fat." He's like, "It had nothing yeah. to do with other than your, I mean, really to the point." But one of the things that when I was talking to him, he was talking about all of these different things, and you know, keto doesn't work long term because we're always looking for a reason to go back. So I feel like now all of a sudden everybody's into carb cycling. What is yep. your thought on that? So, and that's yet another reason that the proper human diet terminology works so well, because then you can ask the very valid question, what is it that you want to go back to? So you're now eating the proper human diet, but you want to go back to the Improper? I mean, what do you want to go back to? So you see, and so that that's another place that that comes in handy. But I 100% agree with Dr. Sivas's addiction model when it comes to carbohydrates. Uh, I think this affects some of us more than others. And basically, carb ups on keto, let me just be blunt here, they are 100% unnecessary for any human being on the planet, regardless of their medical condition. Now, I don't mean to beat around the bush here. Right. <laughs> they Stop mincing words, Dr. Barry. Totally unnecessary. I don't care if you have Hashimoto's. Hypothy. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care where you're at in your menstrual cycle or where you're at uh, in your in your menopausal. There is zero research that backs up the need for carb ups. There's just no research, and there's also no no physiological common sense. Like, oh well, look at this pathway right here. It makes sense. No, no, there's no pathway like that. It would be it's analogous to uh, Alcoholics Anonymous coming up with a thirteenth step saying, well, every Friday, we want you guys to all have a beer up. Right. Right. That, how would that work? That would, that's ridiculous. They would never do that because they would know that for many alcoholics who are, who are in sobriety, that would totally turn over their, their, their wagon. They would yeah. totally be off the wagon and back in rehab again if they had a beer up once a month or tw twice a month or once a week. No human being needs a carb up. No human being needs to carb cycle. There is no physiological need for that whatsoever. And I'm, I hope that I, I was direct and to the point. Well, I actually have some. I'm looking at the comments and somebody said their endocrinologist is keto friendly, but told them they need told her that she needs to look into carb cycling. Yeah. She's like, I don't think it's going to help, but she doesn't want to feel like crap for three days after doing the carb cycle. Exactly right. And so when the when the alcoholics all get, go do the beer up, they're going to be happy that they got to do the beer up. But then they're going to be very sad because it's going to take them another two weeks to break the, the addictive cycle again. Because it's right. not only is it a physiological addiction, but it's also the psychological part, too. And now you've just called up the monkey back on your back. And so when you do this carb up, yeah, there's consequences from that. And, and so if there were a huge benefit to carb ups that you could show me in the medical or nutritional literature, I might say, well, gosh, that's that's impressive. Maybe it's worth feeling like crap for three days. But the fact of the matter is there is no research whatsoever that shows a benefit for carb cycling or carb ups, either frequently or infrequently. And so I agree with the commenter, it's dumb. 
why would you want to feel like crap for three days? Is what we would do every fall when the berries and the fruit got ripe. We would eat the heck out of carbs so that we could gain five to 20 pounds of so we didn't starve to death during the, you want to, if you want to gain some fat carb cycle, it'll work. We've been doing it for thousands of years. We do it once a year in the fall. Right. Well, it's funny. I see Chris mentioned Danny Vega and I know Danny Vega does it, but Danny Vega is also a, a like a, not a normal person. You look builder. at him and the amount that he works out and he's not carb cycling with cinnamon rolls. Like Chris said, He's right. using like sweet potatoes and things right. like that. Yeah. And so my, and I, 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 I love Danny Vega and I love Robert Sykes, but these guys are not normal. Right. <laughs> and I'm, I don't mean that in any negative way. No. I mean their, their lifestyle is not normal. That is not a normal human uh, activity. And that's a, not a normal human body. And so if you want to be an elite level competitive bodybuilder, then you may have to use carbohydrates as a strategy to attain that abnormal body that Robert and Danny have. And I'm not in any way saying that in a negative fashion. I mean, I would much rather you be a bodybuilder than some other hobby some people have, right? But if, and so if what you're trying to have is an optimal human body, I think, I know Robert would tell you this and Danny probably would too, it's not healthy to have that much high, muscular hypertrophy. It's not a healthy thing. It's just like marathon runners that run a hundred miles a week. They'll tell you right up front, this is not healthy. It's not good for your knees. This is not good right. for your hips. Uh, it's it's not healthy, but I love doing it. And so if somebody loves being a bodybuilder or a marathoner, and then therefore they want to tactically use carbohydrates to, to help them be even more unnatural in that hobby, I, I guess so. I guess you could do that, but for me, I would just like to be healthy and normal. Well, talking about knees and hips and mobility, one of the things that we took away from the Proper Human Diet Summit when we sat down and we're just kind of processing everything that we had heard and seen, because it's just so amazing. You've, we've got to rewatch all of the speakers with a notebook to just process all of the things that they talked about. But one of the things that I really had not contemplated and i think we need to get the message out there more is what came up when you and nurse cindy from ask nurse cindy were discussing the importance of staying mobile as you get older and man there's so many seniors that i know that would love to have the frank sinatra song playing you know i did it my way yeah. But staying mobile is going to be very important if you want to be able to do it your way, you yes. know, as far as like living at home and, and what kind of care that you need. So I wondered if you could share a little bit about that, especially when you talk about how simple the exercising can be. Yeah. So two very important concepts. If, if, if the listener wants to live in their own home, and not have to have a caretaker and they want to go to the mailbox and get their own mail and they want to live their own life without being in assisted living or a nursing home or having to have living help. There's two things they've got to focus on. They've got to have strong bones. Hey, Beckett, he's waving at me through the window. Strong bones and you want to have strong muscles. Now, I'm not talking about Danny Vega and Robert Sykes strong. I'm talking about there's a normal loss of bone density and bone strength, and there's a normal loss of muscle if you just follow the normal lifestyle of somebody who's 50, 60, 70, 80, which is basically sit on your butt all day and watch TV. But that's very, very dangerous. I can tell you uh, I would come in Monday morning in the clinic and I would be going through the messages and I would see that, oh, my God, Miss McGillicuddy, my 88-year-old patient, she fell and broke a hip. Now, you you know, you think, well, gosh, that's terrible. Oh, my God, they're going to have to have surgery. But what people don't realize the way doctors realize is when somebody in their 80s breaks a hip, their five-year mortality rate is 80%, which wow. means wow. that Miss McGillicuddy is not going to be with us much longer. Now, there are exceptions to that, but I'm talking about just the average. When somebody in their 70s, 80s, or 90s falls and breaks a hip, that's it. They're done. 
Eighty percent of the time, they will know they will not be with us within five years because it increases. Their, they're going to lose more bone density because they're laid up. They're going to lose more muscle mass because they're laid up. They're going to it it, it because it's very hard mentally on someone that age to be in a different environment, to be in a hospital, to be in a rehab. And so the, the rate of death from all causes skyrockets when this elderly person breaks a hip. So we want to keep our bones as strong as we possibly can and our muscles as strong as we possibly can in, in a normal fashion. So I'm not talking about Danny Vega or Robert Sykes. I'm talking about you as a 70 year old or a 60 year old compared to your peers, your own age. You want to have stronger bones than them and you want to have stronger muscles than them. Not because you're going to get in a fight with them at the senior citizen center and have to beat them up, <laughs> but because when you, when you fall and you are going to fall, you want to bounce, not break. And if you've got a good padding of muscle, people think of fat as padding. Fat's just jelly. Blah, 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 blah. It's not padding. Muscle is padding. And when you exercise enough to keep your muscles stronger, guess what also gets stronger and stays stronger? Your bones. People think bones are like rocks. That they, 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 are, they, they just are what they are. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I talk about this in my osteoporosis video on YouTube. Your bones are constantly either getting stronger or getting weaker on a day-to-day -day basis based on what you feed them and how much you stress them. And stress, that's what exercise is. And so the exercise, you don't have to join the gym and do those cable flies where you look like Batman coming out of the ceiling. You don't have to do any of that. And so if anybody's watching that's 50 or older and you're worried you're losing muscle mass, go follow Ask Nurse Cindy on Facebook. She's got an amazing Facebook page. And she talks about very gentle exercises, very easy ways to start this, also cheap and free. That you, 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 you can literally, so if right now you get short of breath going from your chair to the restroom, that's fine. That's, that's not the end judgment for you. That's just where you're starting from. And so right. Cindy's going to teach you how to do chair ups where you actually stand up out of your chair for no reason at all. There is a reason, but you, you don't know about it right now. But what you're really going to be doing is, is stressing your muscles and bones. That's going to make them both stronger. And you might only be able to stand up out of your chair and sit down one time. And you may have to do this, you know, this move where you have to do this a few times to get up. You may have the to do that, but you are not doomed to have to do that for the rest of your life. If you follow what I advise and what Nurse Cindy advises, before long, you'll be popping up out of that chair like a 40-year-old. And that's when you like uh, he was a karate kid, right? Like wax that's on, right. wax off. He didn't know what he was learning, but the next thing you know, he knew how to do karate. Exactly. And that's what you'll be doing when you're doing Nurse Cindy's Papa Squats and when you're doing her chair ups and when you're walking down the hall and back for no good reason. But that's exercise. You literally are exercising and you just thought you were annoyingly having to walk down the hall and back. There's a, a metric that doctors and physical therapists use for somebody, and we call it a disability score or a frailty score. And we, we have you lay down on your back on the floor and we time you and see how long it takes you to, to go from that position to a stand to stand up. And everybody can do this at home, right? How long does it take you to go from lying on your back on the floor to standing up? And you can Google how what the average score should be. If you're way, if you're lagging far behind that, you're in terrible shape, and you're at super high risk of breaking a bone if you fall. Of of uh, literally dying of any cause goes up the longer it takes you to get off the floor and into a standing position. And so the the message I want everybody to hear is, regardless of your age, I don't care if you're 107 watching this. Congratulations, by the way, you are still <laughs> an athlete. Your bones will respond to the stress. Your muscles will get stronger if you're feeding them the right stuff. And if you're stressing them, you are still an athlete, regardless of your age. You can make your bones stronger. You can make your muscles stronger. And both of those things are going to protect not only your life and your health, but also your independence. If yeah, you yeah. fall and break a hip, you're going to be in rehab for six weeks. At, on the best case scenario, might be nursing home for the rest of your life. So you, you're you going to fall, but you got to be prepared for that by having strong muscles and strong bones. 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Do you mind Do taking you mind a few questions? We'll ask them if anybody's yeah. got any meaningful questions in the chat. Yeah, but while we're waiting for a couple, I so I know a lot of people did not get the opportunity to go to the proper human diet virtual summit because the tickets sold out so quickly. Yeah. yeah. Is it going to be available at some point? Like for I have, a team, I, have, I have a crack team of computer people that does not include Chris Bear. <laughs> who is working on this right now, they're going to take all the lectures, they're going to take all the PDFs, all the Q&As, and they're going to put it into a package so that you can just buy the entire thing. Now, awesome. you won't, there won't be a live section. And there also won't, you, you know how, the, how great it was that people could chat with each other and meet each other. There, there won't be that capability. It'll just be the information, the, all the PDFs. I don't even know if it, it's probably over 100 pages of all the presenter slides and their information. And we're going to try to keep the price super cheap because, you know, we're not trying to make a million bucks here. We're trying to help a million people. And so we're going to keep it as cheap as we possibly can so that as many people as can can afford to get it. And that it that really came through. The all of the speakers that you curated for this event were just it was just so evident that they love people and they want people to get healthy. And again, we talked about from the womb to the tomb because you also had Dr. Fit and Fabulous talking about pregnancy and the proper human diet. And I can see I know we have the right family that that's in our chat right now is, is asking about pregnancy and how can the proper human diet help with things like sciatic nerve problems? Yeah. So, and so that, first of all, pregnancy more and more uh, fertility specialists are starting to, to, to go keto because I found out early in my medical career, when I put women in their forties and even early fifties on keto they had to get back on birth control or they'd get knocked up. And I actually had two women come into my office very unhappy with me, <laughs> one 48, one 51, and they, they were pregnant and they thought they were done. Keto is the diet, the proper human diet, a diet filled with fatty meat is the diet for getting pregnant. Dr. Robert Kills uh, is an OBGYN who specializes in fertility Um our doctor here in Nashville that helped us, he's 100% keto friendly. He said, I don't recommend it yet because it just makes me uncomfortable. But if the patient says, can I eat keto? He says, yes, you can. Okay. So even fertility doctors know this is how you're going to be the most fertile you can be is by eating keto, low carb. Then secondly, like the sciatica, that's, part, that's in, at least in part caused by inflammation. And low carb keto, ketovore, carnivore are the most uninflammatory diets that I have ever seen as a doctor with 20 years of, of experience. I mean, I've recommended the Weight Watchers diet. I've recommended ADA, AHA, DASH diet, Jenny Craig, Flexitarian, all this crap. Nobody ever once came to me and said, hey, I went on Weight Watchers and my knee pain's gone. Right. <laughs> Never. Not once. And that's why I went, that's why it was so weird when I started recommending keto. These people were coming back saying my heartburn's gone, my knee pain's gone, my eczema cleared up. And I'm going, what? What is this thing that I've tripped and fell on? Because never did anybody on the American Diabetes Association say, you know, I've lost 80 pounds and my psoriasis went away. You never hear that. And so that's what people have to understand is there's nothing magic in keto. The magic of keto, low carb, keto, or carnivore is that you're removing things from your diet that were slowly poisoning you and causing chronic inappropriate inflammation. Right. So if, if there's something anatomically wrong with your sciatic nerve, you want inflammation. That's how it's going to heal, right? So if you fall on your butt on the ice and whack your sciatic nerve, you want to have inflammation there for three to 14 days. That's how it's going to heal. But what we don't want is chronic sciatica that lasts 497 damn years because that ain't <laughs> nobody, right? And that's what these diets do, the proper human diet. That's what it does is it removes all the inflammatory slow poison so that your sciatic can just go back to normal. Right. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Gail, 
And uh, my mother would, who's a retired physician, would kill me for not knowing how to pronounce this word. So I'm not going to, sorry. How is it? She's diagnosed, she's got, she basically her doctor wants her to take a statin. She doesn't yeah. want it. So she wants to. She, she, has, be, she has familial hypercholesterolemia. Or That's a spelling yeah. B word. It so is, right? She's yeah. concerned uh, yeah. because she doesn't want to take a statin. Yes. And now uh, Dr. David Diamond, who's a PhD researcher, we should really call him Professor Diamond. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. Oh, yeah. He talks about FH in his lecture in the Proper Human Diet Summit. But you can also, if you if you can't afford the 30 bucks we're going to charge for the summit when he comes out, and it's probably going to be a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll make it available. But you can find him online talking about familial hypercholesterolemia and how it's not actually a risk factor for increased risk of heart attack and stroke at all. All the doctors just assumed it was. They just assumed that people with FH would die in their 30s, 40s, or 50s unless they took a statin. But when you actually go back and look at the research, and we're talking about people who have FH, they have total cholesterols of 400, and they have LDLs of, of 350, 450. They live just as long as people without FH. When you actually look at the research without the preconceived notion that high LDL cholesterol is bad for you, they, they don't have to take a statin. And Dr. David Diamond really breaks that down. And also Dave Feldman from cholesterolcode.com. He also, mm -hmm. also talks about FH a lot and how it's not a big deal. I, because doc, I used to do this back in 2002, 2003. If I saw that you had FH, I would, I would literally try to scare you to tears to get you to take that statin every day for the rest of your life. Because I believe the, the bull crap. I didn't know better. I'd never actually looked at the actual studies themselves. I was just taught by MDs and PhDs to be very afraid of familial hypercholesterolemia, when the fact is it's not that big a deal at all. Yeah. Okay, so we have somebody who wants to know if you can be allergic to anything in the daily minerals. At, no, it's impossible. And so, and a lot of people are like, wait, what? Yeah. So these are all essential minerals that occur in groundwater. If these minerals are in the soil that your food was grown in, then they're in, they're in the food that you're eating too. Uh, a lot of people falsely believe that they have an iodine allergy, right? And they may have been told by their doctor, you have an iodine allergy, you need to avoid seafood, but this is, these are the words of an ignorant doctor. And she's saying word, that she's allergic to sodium ferric glutamate name brand. Yeah, so there's no preservatives in this. So, okay. yeah, there's not going to be any of that. But, but there are people who genuinely believe they're allergic to iodine. But they're not. It's impossible to be allergic to iodine. If I were to be able, like the old uh, televangelist on TV, be able to reach through the television screen and pull all the evil iodine out of your body, you would be dead in minutes. That's how important iodine is. Every single human being on the planet has to have iodine or they will die. There is no human being that's allergic to iodine. So if any of you guys watching have been told by your doctor you're allergic to iodine, Go watch my iodine video on YouTube and then go have a talk with your doctor and maybe try to keep your finger down. But you may have to do this because it's really an, it's it's and I've said this before, before I knew better. But it's an ignorant thing for a doctor to tell someone that they're allergic to an absolutely essential element. It's just it's just ridiculous. Yeah. OK, I found here's a really good one um, from Amy. And she said uh, she has been eating keto for two years and I'm having problems with my joints. So my doctor put me on anti-inflammatories. Are there any keto foods that are inflammatory? Yes, definitely. There are some keto friendly foods that for some people are inflammatory, but there is also a mineral angle that I'll get back to at the end of this. So for some of us, we can eat all the green veg in the world and it doesn't bother us at all. For some of us, if we eat too much spinach, right? Or, or some of the other greens, or even some vegetables. Some people, if we eat nightshades, even though they're relatively low carbohydrate fruits, we'll start to immediately get joint pain. And I'm one of those people. If I eat, if I eat tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, within a day, my, my right knee, which I injured in, in high school, will start to hurt. 
Not because there's anything wrong with my knee, but because that the 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 components of the nightshade flared up my chronic inflammation in my knee. Uh, and for other people, it's the oxalates, it's the phytates, it's the it's the lectins, and it's it's never in meat. It's always in veg. And so, for you guys out there who love your veg, if you want to eat the kind of keto where you eat seven to ten cups of salad a day, and you're still having joint pain, it's probably the veg. Sorry. And so. <laughs> know whether it is or not is to try a 30 day or a 90 day carnivore challenge and see if your inflammation goes away. Now back to the minerals. That's one of the reasons that I came up with this formulation is because many of us, even though we're eating keto, the whole food, real keto, we're still having these weird symptoms, right? Like, I don't know, I still have joint inflammation. And so people don't realize that that elements like boron, and chromium and selenium are vital to normal joint functions without with if you're deficient in boron you can develop osteoporosis even though you do your papa squats every day if you don't have boron in your diet and who who the heck knows what foods have boron i haven't done a youtube (laughs) video about that one yet i'll have to but but that's the thing is if you're deficient in one of these minerals, it's not even your fault because maybe you watch my YouTube video about iodine rich foods and you're trying to eat those. But if, if though, if the fish you're eating is farmed, you may not be getting nearly as much iodine as you should be getting from that fish. If you're expecting to get selenium and iodine from the veg that you're eating because you looked it up and it said that broccoli has this much selenium. Well, guess what? If there's none in the dirt that the broccoli grew in, it is impossible for the broccoli to contain any selenium whatsoever. Even though you're doing the best you can to eat the proper human diet, I really feel like this mineral formulation is the missing element for a lot of us who are doing keto, not losing the weight we should be losing, or still having aches and pains, or still having skin issues. It's probably the minerals. Wow. Wow. So Chris brought up a question. I have one more question for you and then we'll let you go. So Chris said, I can positively tell you that vegetable oils cause influence, cause an inflammation. So what that reminded me of, I wanted to ask you, so I've been watching you since you, I don't even, you had very few subscribers. We, we, I mentioned it to you during the proper human Mm -hmm. diet. You literally saved my life and through me, Rachel's life, her brother's life, her mother's life. I mean, her mother, 20 years of type two diabetic and no longer classified as a diabetic. So we thank you for that. The first thing that I gave up was vegetable oils because you told me to. Yep. But when somebody starts on the keto diet and they say like, they look at us and they're like, well, you're eating pasture raised eggs and you're not eating like Hellman's mayonnaise and and you're trying to eat a little bit better meats and, and those kind of things. If they can only make one change when they start, what is the first thing other than cutting out the carbohydrates that they need to switch over? And what would most people would say is a keto food? Yeah. So step one, cut out all the sugar of any kind, both added sugar and natural sugar. Step two, cut out all the grains, wheat, rice, oats, corn, but also millet, millet, amaranth, quinoa, all those things. Cut them all out. Step three. Get rid of all the vegetable oils, all of them. If anybody's watching right now and you've got canola oil sitting in your kitchen, get up right now, go get it and put it in the garbage because it's trash. It is dangerous trash, okay? Step four is to start eating lots more meat in your diet. And I want you to eat the best quality meat that you can afford. But in my YouTube video about cheap keto, eating hot dogs and bologna and spam is a thousand times better than eating whole wheat and Cheetos and Doritos. So eat the best quality meat that you can afford. But at the end of the day, just eat your meat. And then a a really quick way to know that you're keto is if we're talking about the plate, right? We're not going to talk about my plate because that's stupid. We're going to talk about Dr. Barry's plate. Your plate's going to be covered with at least two thirds fatty meat, And then you can cover the the other third with veg, okay? And then if that if you're still having inflammation, you can cover the whole plate with meat and see how that works. But at least two thirds of your plate needs to be fatty meat of some kind, whether it's seafood, whether it's ruminants, or whether it's 
uh, possum roadkill, whatever you can afford, eat the best you can afford. But in the end, eat your meat. I, I When you're talking about oil, I saw in your Patreon support group on Facebook yesterday. What about palm oil and coconut oil? Palm oil is way less bad than the other vegetables. And it's actually a fruit oil, just like coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil. Those are fruit oils. And you can actually, it's actually pretty easy to get oil out of an avocado or an olive or palm, uh, palm uh, fruits. You literally can just do it on your kitchen stove. And so I don't think they're nearly as inflammatory. Okay. And I think for some of us, and I am one of these people, I use exclusively animal fats. I use butter, lard, ghee, uh, beef tallow, bison tallow, duck fat, because for me, even coconut and avocado oil is a bit inflammatory for me. Okay. <laughs> and I don't think it is for everybody. I think some people can use coconut, avocado, and olive oil, and they do just fine, and they, they live their best best keto life. But for some of us, even the, the fruit oils like avocado, olive, and coconut, and, and palm are too inflammatory for us. So, Jennifer, thank you very much for the $5 super chat. Now, I want to say it before I even ask this question. I want to say this is Dr. Bear is not giving medical advice. Nope. Okay. So, he is a doctor, but he's not your doctor. So, this is like reading a book. Uh, she wants to know, is there a link between lower cancer risks and keto, given that almost 40% of Americans will at some point get cancer in their lives? Yeah, that's an excellent question. There has never been a study done that would prove that. And there probably never will be a study done that would prove that. Because in order to do a study that would prove that, we would have to put 100 people in an arm of the study that ate Cheetos and crackers and and, and string cheese. Then we'd have to put another 100 people in the group that ate keto. And so one of those groups you're putting, putting in danger, depending on what your current nutrition beliefs are, right? And so, you know, all the, all the powers that be would believe that you're putting the keto group in danger, but all the keto people would know you putting the Cheeto people, that's who's in danger. But that study's never going to be done. But what we can look at is human physiology and the physiology of cancer. So when we look for cancer in the human body, we use a scan called a PET, a PET scanner, right? The way a PET scanner look, looks for cancer, the way it works is they attach a molecule to a sugar molecule, and then they inject that into your bloodstream. Cancer loves sugar, loves it. It cannot grow and metastasize without sugar. And so the cancer will immediately take up all the sugar with the tag on it. That's how we find cancer in the human body with a PET scan. We don't attach the, 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 the tag molecule to fat. We don't attach it to protein. We attach it to sugar because cancer loves sugar. Do you get that? So even, even cancer researchers know that if you're looking for cancer in the human body, the way you find cancer is to feed the body sugar and the, the cancer immediately, it takes up way more sugar than the other tissues in your body does. And so it glows on the PET scan. And so from just simple common sense physiology of the human body and of cancer, you can quickly deduce. So if cancer takes up sugar really fast like that, that must mean that cancer needs lots of sugar. Yeah, that's right. It does. Okay, there are some cancers that can stumble by on fat. But there is no cancer out there that can thrive and metastasize without sugar. It just doesn't work. Cancer has to have sugar in order to, in order to take over your body and kill you. So if you're eating, by definition, a low sugar diet, and keto is even low in natural sugar. We just we don't eat the fruits because we know that sugar, sugar. Cancer don't care if that sugar came from a Pepsi Cola or an organic glass of fresh squeezed orange juice. Cancer don't give a damn. It just wants the sugar. And that's what you got to understand. And so in that respect, just physiologically, it makes sense that a low sugar diet is going to slow down the development of cancer, but also the progression of cancer. Wow. 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 I, as a matter of fact, I, you know, I, I know, I think I mentioned it once before. My mom just retired from 50 plus years of being an oncologist. And one of her frustrations towards the end of her career was 
she wanted to tell patients diet, 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 cut out the sugar, but would literally get in trouble by like the superiors in the hospital that you can't do that. You can't tell them it's diet. You have to push, you know, the chemotherapy and stuff. And it's one of the things that finally made her retire at the age of 80. Yeah. And it's really sad, but I, I predict that oncology, uh, which is the, the fighting cancer, the doctor who tries to cure cancer, that's oncology. I predict that they're going to be the next big group of doctors to start adopting keto. They're still going to want to do their radiation therapy and their chemotherapy. But what they're going to quickly realize is when I starve that cancer of sugar, my treatments work better and I have a higher success rate right? Because if you've already crippled the sugar by, by starving it of the sugar that it so desires, if you've, if you've crippled the cancer and it's starving, then it's not going to take nearly as much chemo or radiation to kill that cancer because it's already starving to death because you're, you're withholding the sugar that it vitally needs to thrive and metastasize. You're holding that sugar by feeding that patient a keto diet. So I think after enough oncologists hear from their patients, oh, I, I eat keto the whole way through, and then they start going, you know, every time somebody tells me they ate keto through chemo, they're actually still alive. And the people who don't eat keto through chemo, they die a lot more often. Oncologists, they, they know that their success rate matters, right? People talk about that out in the community and, and, and they keep up with that themselves. And so when they start seeing a higher success rate of curing cancer, when somebody's a, uh, a reproductive specialist already have. Wow. Well, I think that that is a... Yeah, I'm excited about that. It's going to be incredible. I can't wait. Well, we're having a lot of people saying, thank you, Dr. Barry. Thank you, Dr. Barry. Not just for being here tonight, but for the influence that you've had on their life. So like... Well, thank yeah, I love doing it. I'm never going to shut up no matter what burns down. And you guys, if, if, if I've helped your health in some way then your job, your duty is to now it's your turn to pass it on and help somebody else because the answers are not going to come from the top down. They're going to come from friends and neighbors. And I need for you to be a good friend and neighbor and share your story. Yeah. And if you're not subscribed to Dr. Barry, go join his, go sign up on his YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, sign up for the bell notifications, go on his Facebook group, go become a patron of his. We're patrons of Dr. Barry's because like what he does is so it's vital. important. It's vital. So we really appreciate you, Dr. Barry, for coming on tonight, discussing some of these questions. And we're super excited about what the future has to hold for the proper human diet. Well, me too. Me too. I can't wait. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks everybody for tolerating me. I'll see you next time. Bye guys. Bye.